I know, people trying to get online stuff going. Okay, quiz nine. Basically, as always, it's going to be set up just like the quiz itself is going to be. So you notice right at the top, factoring is kind of a big deal on this particular one. And they're all kind of blended together. And that's done on purpose because I want you thinking about these things. Whenever you see a two-termer, typically one of two things is going to happen. Either you're going to have a factor, a common factor that you can take out, which you want to check on every problem anyway. Or you're going to have a difference of squares or a sum or difference of cubes. Here, I see perfect squares right away, and that second power doesn't hurt either. So when I'm looking at this one right away, I'm like, oh, well, whatever I square to get each of those, so I square 8x to get 64x squared, and I square 7 to get 49, and I know when it's a difference, if I want the product to multiply to a negative, I need one of each of those. I'm done. Notice no equals zeros. I didn't use the word solve anywhere. So for those of you that have gotten nabbed on that before, well, you're not going to get nabbed this time. Now five is two, five. Number two is the one that gets me nervous with some of you. Some of you pay no attention to see if there's a common factor at the start. You just factor right away. And then you get dinged for a half because it's not completely set. Here, I can factor a five out before I ever start. Once I do that, the 5 doesn't disappear. It just sits in, out in front as a coefficient of sorts. And, but now I just got to figure out what multiplies to negative 8 and adds to negative 2. Well, I know a couple of things. I know 1's minus and 1's plus because of the negative product. And I also know the bigger number is going to be negative because my sum in the middle is negative 2. So negative 4 and positive 2 and that's as far as I could go. Now some of you may say, well again, I didn't factor at the start. I didn't take the 5 out. I got 5x minus 20 and x plus 2. Is that okay? Yes and no. Would it foil out to the original problem? Yes. But is that as simplified or factored as completely as possible? No. So you'd lose a little bit of credit on that one. But again, as we move along, whenever you see the short ones, again, Look for a common factor or clues like, ooh, cube. Ooh, I know 125 is a cube, or at least you should know 125 is a cube. And this goes back to the pattern that we talked about, the one that you have to know, because if you don't, there's no long way around this one. So whatever I cube to get each of these, and again, I'm not going to pay attention to that minus and make it negative 5. I'm just going to use 5. My first set of parentheses is always going to be the two terms with their sign in the middle. And then remember the pattern. Square your first term. Switch the sign. So since this is minus, this becomes plus. Take the product of the two. And then add your last term squared. And the nice thing about these, they never break down. That's done and I don't have to think about it. But again, whether it's two or three terms, you always should look to see if you have a greatest common factor. Because if you do, for instance, what's the largest number that goes into all three of these? Six. Uh, what about my variable term? X cubed, because I always take the smallest exponent I see. Once I do that, again, that even makes the problem easier to work with because now instead of trying to figure out, you know, common multiples of 120, now it's just working with this. Again, the 6x to the third doesn't go away, it just kind of hangs out. And again, let the clues that are in there help you not to make a silly mistake. I know one's plus and one's minus with a negative product. Bigger number has to be positive to get this in the middle. So five and negative four. And I'm all factored up. When you have four terms, again, split them up and conquer. Take them a pair at a time. 
pull out the greatest common factor from each pair. And hopefully, if we've done things right, when I do this next one, I get the same thing. Now you may look at this and go, well, they don't have anything in common. Well, when they don't have anything in common, I can always take a one, and I need to. I gotta take something out of there. So once I get here, I'm not done. Don't stop and circle it. My greatest common factors, they get to go together. And again, I only need one of my common factor. But here's the question. Can I break down x squared plus 1? Okay. With squares, it's only differences, only minus. Cubes I can do both, but not squares. Remind yourself of that. That one's done. Hmm. Now I see that 3 there, so I'm starting to wonder if this is a cube, but wait a minute, 32 is not a cube. What am I forgetting about? What am I not thinking about? What do I need to do first? What? A common factor, okay. What might a common factor be here? 2x, nicely done. Because if I take out the 2x, well, how amazing is that? All of a sudden, what I see left is a difference of squares. If I wouldn't have taken that out, I'd have never thought of that. I'd never have seen it. I'd have thought it was just already simplified and I was done. So what squares to get 16x squared? 4x. What squares to get 25, 5, and again, it's plus minus because of our negative product. And we're done. But again, you have to get that far. Here, now maybe I'm not sure. I'm looking at 343 and I'm going, I heard he basically only told us we had to really get up to 5. I don't know if 343 is one or not. How do I tell? Well, here's how we're going to tell. With the calculator, it gets a little more interesting because you're like, um, you know, is there a cubed root button? Some of you may have one. Um, if you don't, you always can take a number to the one-third power because remember, it's exponent, and my exponent at 343 would be 1, over root, and the root I'm looking for is the third one. And sometimes that can clean things up for me. So my first term with my cube would be 2x because I cubed 2 to get 8 and x to get x cubed. And my second term is going to be 7 because, again, I know how to find my cubed root. So then all I do, 2x, keep the sign in the middle. And here's where I've got to be careful. The pattern is square my first term. Not just the x, square the 2 as well. So 4x squared, change signs, take the product, so 14x plus the square of my last term. So I've got to know my pattern. And then the only other weird thing you're going to have thrown at you is this x to the fourth. That you're like an x to the fourth trinomial. Ugh. And what I always tell people is the key here is to not think of it like it's x to the fourth. Think of it like it's x squared. Because most of you, if you saw that, would be happy to see it. You'd be like, oh, I'm just trying to figure out what multiplies to this and adds to this. Well, that's no big deal. It's negative 8 and negative 2. Okay. The same thing's going on here, except now, instead of x times x being x squared, x squared times x squared is x to the fourth. And if one of these had been a perfect square. So like, let's say this would have been like 16 or 4. I'd have been able to break down this factor more. But 
neither of those are perfect squares, neither 2 nor 8, so that one's done. So that's all I'm doing up there with the factoring. Now the inverses shouldn't be a bad part of this, but sometimes they can be. So for instance, let's see here. Find the inverse of the relation, state whether the relation is a function and whether the inverse is a function. Okay. First, find the inverse. From back when we did this on the notes, we said when you're given points or a chart, all you're doing is switching the x and y values around. So here, I'll flip the x and the y. I'll flip the x and the y. And I will flip the x and the y. Okay, that would be the inverse of my relation. Just flipping the x and y values. So then I've got to look and say, okay, is this relation a function? Well, let's see. How do I tell if something's a function or not? Ooh. And I don't have a graph. I guess I could, I could draw a graph if I really wanted to look at it that way. But if I don't want to draw a graph and I just have these points, how do I tell if something's a function or not? I have them stumped. Do any x values repeat? In the original problem, do any of the x values repeat? No, so if not, it's a function. If any of your x values were to repeat, then it's not a function. Because remember, when we're doing this, if I were to plot these points, we're using the vertical line test. Okay, the one that goes up and down to see if it goes through. Now remember, that's for my original. When I get to my inverse, we're using the horizontal line test, which would be checking your y values. Do any of the y values repeat in my inverse, no, which is also a good thing. No repeats for y equals a function when I get to my inverse. Different x values gets me a function on my original. Different y values get me a function on my inverse. And again, if you really wanted to, you could, if you weren't sure and just looking at the values, it wouldn't kill you. It wouldn't be anything too terribly awful. Because again, I'm always telling you, look for ways that you can get to your solution no matter what that is. So if you had to graph these, You're like, yep, that's going to pass the vertical line test. Okay. And then you take the other ones and you graph those. Are they going to pass the horizontal? Yep. Okay. Draw a picture. No biggie. They give me an expression, and we know that f of x really equals y. How do I go about finding the inverse algebraically? two steps. Okay, switch x and y. And once I do that, now what? Solve for y. Now again, me, I'd really recommend getting that 12 out of there first before you start playing with fractions. And once you have that term isolated, again, this is where I want some of you to be careful. I know some of you are going to want to divide by two-thirds. 
But again, if you don't know how to deal with that, I don't want to see your answer as x plus 12 divided by 2 over 3. That you don't understand the sense that goes with that. At least most of you don't. So either I want you to multiply by the reciprocal, which is what dividing by 2 thirds would be anyway. And then when you get here, you could leave it like this, or you could actually distribute your 3 halves through and get something that looks like this. But if you wrote 3 halves x plus 12, I'd absolutely take it. Or if some of you wanted to multiply through by 3 and then divide by 2, that would work too. So you have options, but as long as you switch x and y, and then solve for y, you'll be good on that. And then comes the infamous number 11, which was a killer on the last quiz. Hence, it is here again. So when we're talking about these, okay, revenue from the sale of yearbooks is given by. This means I'm getting $65 each for those, is what we're talking about there. And then our costs would be $40 per book plus like an $1,800 setup fee or something is what that would be. So when I ask you what the yearbooks are selling for, okay, we don't want to say like for school. We want to actually want like numbers, like $65. When it says write the profit function, again, profit is found by taking revenue minus cost. My revenue is $65 times every one I sell. My cost is $40 for each one I sell plus an $1,800 setup. And here's where some of you got caught on this before. You were good about minusing the 40x and making this 25x. But then you'd write plus 1,800, which is incorrect because I'm subtracting this whole quantity. That's my profit function. $25 times the number of books minus 1,800. To find the profit, and these two go hand in hand. So if you mess up B, you're going to mess up C. So be cautious. Let's see, 3,000... 1800 looks like we're going to make about 1200 bucks. But again, it's understanding revenue minus cost is what's going to get your profit function for you and make that work. All right. Another one, we had some, Yes, sir. Um, I think we were supposed to have an extra zero in there, weren't we? 25 times 1200. Oh, 30,000. Oh, hardy, 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 hardy. Let's rewind over to here. Good call. 30,000 minus 1,800. I thought we weren't making very much for selling that many yearbooks. Something wasn't working. So let's see here. 29, 28,200. That's better. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You could. I'm not telling them that, though. <laughs> but yes, you absolutely could. So then when we get to our inequality as an interval, I would have to factor this, if it's factorable, which this one is. But then I need to know what my zeros are so I can figure out what my inequality is going to be. So I would set these each equal to zero. So I'd find out my zeros were at 4 and negative 9. At this point, I can do one of two things. If I recognize by looking at the inequality arrow, if it's an and or an or statement, and this one's an and because it's less than, and statements just take the endpoints and take the values in between. For instance, if I were to graph this with a number line, okay, 
and I were to test out a middle point like zero like we did before, negative 36 is less than or equal to zero. That's true. That means I'm shading in this middle area and that would match up with what my interval notation looked like. But I need this, not the graph. The graph can help, but this is what I need. Another inverse, similar to 10. Switcheroo, the X and the Y. Hmm. What should I do next on 13? Square both sides. Okay. Okay, no plus minus. It's not a quadratic we're working with. It's a square root function. And then just add the 5 over. And that one's good. Then we get into a couple that should be easier. Should. This is a minus. You do not foil on this. Well, you wouldn't foil anywhere. It's 3 by 3, but you get my idea. So again, watch the sign. 5 minus 11, negative 6x cubed. Negative 2 minus 8 is negative 10. Negative 9 minus a negative 7. So negative 9 plus 7 is negative 2, and I can do no more. So don't make more work of this out of your, for yourself and then have it go bad anyway. 15 choices. There's a the short way, there's the long way. Long way would be you write this out as three quantity x plus fours and then you foil the first two and then you multiply the answer through by the third one. That takes a long time. If I remember my pattern from what we did before when I'm dealing with a cubic and also remembering that I go with my degrees down for my A term and up for my B, so I'd say, okay, so 1 is x cubed plus 3x squared times my b term plus 3 times my a term times b squared plus my b term cubed. And again, notice the pattern. With my cubic, 3, 2, 1, zero, but with my second term it does just the opposite. Zero, degree of one, degree of two, degree of three. So as long as you keep that little down and up pattern going, it shouldn't work out too bad. But again, I need to multiply these out still. Don't just leave that and say, ooh, I got the answer. Four times three would be 12 x squared. Four squared is 16 times 3 is 48x, and 4 cubed is 64. And like I said, you could foil this out and then distribute it again with that, but if you know the pattern, it's going to be a lot quicker for you. And a lot less places to make errors, too. All right, draw an example of a graph whose inverse is a function. In other words, that can pass the horizontal line test. So let's see. Something that passes the horizontal line test. Mm. Parabola sideways would. You could draw just a regular old linear equation, just draw a line through there, that would work, that would pass the horizontal line test. As long as your graph passes that, you're good. And that's all you'd have to do. Let's see, function notation. Don't let this get harder than it needs to either. F minus G of X, okay. F of X minus G of X. I am not multiplying X through. This just tells me I want f of x minus g of x. This minus this. Get that negative distributed through. 3 minus 1 is 2. Negative 1 minus 6 is minus 7. Done. 
No foiling, no multiplying, no nothing. Just combine like terms. Next one just means we're multiplying 3x minus 1 and x plus 6 together. Whether you're a foiler, a boxer, I don't care. So let's see here. If we multiply it out, 3x squared plus 18x minus x minus 6. And combine my like terms in the middle. And don't get careless here and put like 19 or something. And we're good. Composition of functions, the big circle, f of g of x, which means I'm going to take my g of x function and plug it into f. In other words, I'm going to do f of x plus 6. So now where x is in f, I'm going to replace it with what's in the parentheses, x plus 6. Distribute that 3 on through. Ready to roll. And you'll notice in none of them so far when it's talked about stating and domain restriction, we haven't been saying anything because we haven't hit one of our two problems, which again is an even root or a fraction where x is in the denominator, like this. I can't simplify this as far as my function goes, but what number is going to cause me trouble? What's going to cause the denominator to equal 0? Oops, x plus 6 cannot equal 0 minus the 6 over. Okay, x can't equal negative 6, and we talked about before with the interval for that. It basically is just going to be me writing every number humanly possible except negative 6. So whatever this value is, that's what's going to go in here for both of those every single time. But for all of these, again, where it's something of x, I'm not multiplying the extra x in. That's just a label telling me what I'm doing, whether I'm multiplying, finding a composition, or whatever it happens to be. When I get down here, keep it simple. Plug the 7 in, figure out what it is, and just multiply those things together. 7 minus 4 is 3. Okay. 9 plus 7 is 16. And I'm done. I don't have to plug one into the other first and then plug the number in. That's a waste of time. Here, I want to find q of p of negative 2. Okay, what's p of negative 2? Negative 2 minus 4 is negative 6. But it's the absolute value, so it comes out positive. So it's q of 6. Okay, so 9 plus 6 is 15. It's just working my way out from the inside. But whatever comes second, that's what you're plugging into the first one. And that's what you've got to keep an eye on. Given the graph, let's see. Domain, we always know what domain is. It just goes forever out and out. What about my range, though? Bottom to top, what would that look like? Where is my lowest y value? Negative 75. And then it goes up and up and up forever from there. And again, when we talk about end behavior, one of my x approaches will be to the left, which is negative infinity. One will be to the right, as it approaches infinity. So as x approaches negative infinity, as this graph starts to approach negative infinity, what's happening to y? It's going up. Up is positive infinity. 
As x approaches positive infinity, as it goes to the right, what happens? It keeps on going up to positive infinity. So I'm just following along, seeing, okay, what direction is it heading in? And that's basically all I'm ever saying for end behavior. And a little more of functions. Graph f of x and f, the inverse of f of x on the same graph. Okay, I'm going to graph this one in red. So I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to graph this line. But now I have to find the inverse of that line. So like we mentioned before, f of x is just a fancy way of saying y. I'm going to switch my x and y. And I'm going to solve for y. So I'll minus the 2 over. And if I just multiply by 2, that'll take care of that. I need to distribute it out because I really would like this in slope-intercept form to make it easier to graph. And once I have that, There's my line because remember the line y equals x is my line of symmetry where if I were to fold this over I would get a mirror image. So that lets me kind of see how that one works and I see that that would be the case if I were to fold this. Actually let's try this. I'm going to give myself a lot of credit here if I can actually make this fold in the right place. Close. That's not bad. Except I can't really see it. But it'll go through there and be like my line of symmetry. And then finally, solve by the method of your choice. Answers must be in exact simplified form. In other words, if it comes out as a radical, leave it in the radical. Don't go to a decimal. Here I'm hoping. that you would notice that they have a greatest common factor. And then again, solve equals zero, don't stop. Set each of those equal to zero and get the two solutions that you know you're gonna get because of the degree. Now on the next one, you may try to factor it and you're probably going to look at that for a minute and go, yeah, that's not going to do me any good. So then you're like, um, let's see. Some of you may think completing the square is a good idea until you'd find out you'd have to divide through by 9 first. That's a fraction. That's not fun. What's another option we'd have? Yeah, the quadratic formula. All right, let's give this a go. So negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4 times a times c all over 2a. All right. Oh, let's see. 81 minus a lot more than 81. No. 81 minus 16 times 9 is 144. Negative 63. Oh, this is going to be fun. Okay. Bless you. So negative 63, a couple of things. First, 63 breaks down, 9 and 7. What else should I be doing this time? Taking an eye out. Taking an eye out. So square root of 9 is 3, so it's going to hang out with my eye. Square root of 7, because 63 would be 3 square root of 7, but the eye's got to come 2. Over 18, ooh. Do I get to circle this one yet? Nope, gotta get a three. Each one of these, again, don't do anything under the radical, that's a different story. But if all three of these have something in common that I could take out or reduce what I need to, and they all are divisible by three. So that's what we're gonna do. Again. 
this will be on the website along with, I'll even show you where it's going to be. They're like, oh crap, he's going to change things. If you go to this week, and if this ever loads, there it is. Okay. Blank previews are here. The key is right here. And as soon as I get it downloaded after next hour, the video is going to be right here if you need it. So don't blow this off. Don't do it.